Uh, well, anybody else just waiting there? I think we're about there. Let's see. Morning to everybody. There's Harry. Morning, Harry. Nice to see you. Morning, James. Morning, Philip. Morning, Neil. And there's morning. James. And who else we got? We got Adrian there. Fantastic. Lee. Good morning. Nice to see you. Fantastic. Great. I think we're going to uh, we're going to kick straight off. Uh, so, uh, warm welcome to you. Um, let me just. How do I get rid of Neil? Neil seems to be dominating the screen. We don't want to get rid of you, Neil, but. Um, uh, don't worry, because we're going to we're going to switch to switch to slides in just a second. So, a very warm welcome to everybody who's here live, and a very warm welcome to uh, everybody who is uh, watching on the recording, which will be available a little bit later on. Um, I'm not going to waste any of your time. I want to really try and stick to time. The whole point about this uh, is that we stick to time so that we actually get some stuff done, which is really really important. So, I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to get straight on with it. Just bear with me. And hopefully, uh, there we go, you can see that. So just give me a thumbs up if you can see uh, see a title slide. Absolutely fantastic. And give me a thumbs up if you can hear me clearly. Superb. Looks like everybody can hear me. Fantastic. Great. So uh, my name is Phil Calvert. And to those of you that I've not met before, a very warm welcome. Hope you're going to enjoy this. I want this to be as, as much fun as, as anything else. Um, the whole point of this is so that we actually all learn something and actually get something done, but I do want it to be fun as well. A um, little bit of background for those of you that um, I've not met before. Uh, I've been in financial services for over 42 years now, the first 20 of which was with uh, leading product providers like Zurich Life you'll have heard of. Um, I did the first 10, 12 years of my life as a broker consultant. Um, calling on financial advisors. And I used to meet 20 financial advisors uh, every single week. And I did that for about 10 or 12 years. Uh, I then went into the national accounts role. Um, so I was looking after the really big financial advisors. But um, over those 20 years with providers, I've met a huge number of uh, IFAs, financial planners, mortgage brokers, protection advisors. Um, and I kind of think I've probably met more financial advisors than anybody else uh, in the industry. Uh, when I was eventually made redundant, um, I then went out on my own as an independent sales and marketing consultant, predominantly focusing on regulated industries. Uh, so as well as financial advisors, accountants, lawyers, and I do also do work in uh, pharma as well. Pharma is a very exciting place right now. Um, I created the world's first social networking platform in financial services, Back in 2003, 2004, it started life was basically a group on a social networking platform, and it was for financial advisors to network, share best practice, exchange ideas, help each other out. Exactly the same as you are seeing going on in our Facebook group today, our LinkedIn group, and we've got a couple of other groups elsewhere as well. I've written a few books, um, and when I started out, I didn't go to university, I didn't go to college. Um, I was a rock concert photographer. I absolutely was passionate about photography. I still am, still absolutely love it. I used to get a press pass. Um, I was up the front there at Wembley Arena, or the Empire Pool Wembley, as it was known then, Hammersmith Odeon, the Rainbow Theatre. Uh, and I used to uh, take photos. I used to, most of the, the, the heavy rock bands, a couple of pictures, one of Judas Priest, one of ZZ Top, uh, both still going strong today. And, you know, if I, if, if I had a choice and, uh, and they said, Phil, what would you like to do from here on? Uh, and you were guaranteed success. I would actually go back into doing rock concert photography. It was something I absolutely loved doing. Uh, and for one year, I was officially the world's best gin and tonic maker. Uh, quite a few years ago, many years ago, I met a guy on a train uh, who taught me how to make the perfect gin and tonic. Uh, and to cut a very long story short, his name was John Tankery, uh, the great grandson of Charles Tankery, the creator of Gordon's Gin. And he taught me the secret family way that uh, a gin and tonic was supposed to be made. Uh, a couple of years later, I put this to, to the test. I entered the World Cocktail Making Championships. And I entered the gin category and I won the best gin and tonic in the world. And I'm sure some of you right now would rather we spend the next 60 minutes talking about gin and tonic. Uh, but we'll save that for another day. Um, one of you here today 
um, at plus the people who are going to be watching on the recording. I'll send you a signed copy of each of these books. Um, and I'll, tell you, I'll also throw in my book on how to make the perfect gin and tonic as well. Um, so one of you will get a signed copy of each of those as well. So why are we doing this? Um, there's some really interesting changes going on in the profession, um, which have been accelerated by COVID. They were changes that were taking place anyway. Um, and they are more around how financial advisors communicate their value to the wider world. Uh, if you're in our Facebook group, the topic of lead generation comes up time and time and time again, and people are always asking questions. What do people think about unbiased? What do people think about vouched for? What do people think about LinkedIn? All those different ways of generating leads. Um, I think as a profession, we are wildly behind uh, other industries, other professions in terms of how we communicate our value. We all know the great work that financial advisors do. And from time to time, we see this in the Facebook group where somebody says, you know, they, they were able to tell a client today that a, a PHI claim was being paid or critical illness claim was being paid, um, or how they were able to tell a client that they could actually retire three or four years earlier than they were going to, and they didn't know they could do this. There is amazing work that financial planners and financial advisors do, but we are frankly, appalling at how we communicate how good we are um which is which is a shame um and covid has been really interesting in terms of what it's thrown up in terms of how financial advisors communicate those that were really quick off the mark you know back in march april just to get in touch with their clients you know when the market was taking a tumble just to get in touch with their clients and say you've probably seen that the market's taking a tumble but more just to say hi we're here for you just somebody to talk to, um, those financial advisors will not be forgotten. There are still financial advisors who still not got in touch with their clients, just on a courtesy thing, just to see how they are. So things are changing. We really need to up our game when it comes to communication and also how we communicate our value to the wider world, because we all know the wider world needs your services in some way, shape or form. Um, why are we doing this? We're, we're, it's fundamentally about marketing. The different challenges that, that I've put up there are ultimately about marketing. They are also, uh, some of them are, at least, are about taking the expertise that you've already got and turning it into something else. There is still uh, a strong school of thought in this profession that financial planning is only ever done between consenting adults, either in their home, your office, or increasingly on Zoom, and that's it. Um, whereas if there's one thing that we've really got quite good at now, we're doing it in a slightly clunky way, but the striving for professionalism through examinations and other quality standards, uh, it, it, we're just getting better and better at this. Um, but financial advisors have got, depending on how much experience you've got, a huge amount of expertise, a huge amount of credibility, but we are only delivering that expertise uh, in a very limited number of ways. So some of the challenges will be about taking the expertise that you've got and turning them into something else, something of value that you could sell or give away or add value to your existing clients. And I think adding value to existing clients is, is something that um, is starting to come up more and more. Those of you that have taken the marketing mindset uh, test recently, you'll notice there was a whole section about adding value to ex existing clients in there as well. Why else are we doing this? To get something done. Um, I'm putting a time limit on this of 21 days because, and, and some of you, I'm, it, it's great that if you're going to take this on, but I'd like you to get it done in 21 days. And I'm going to do my best to help you get it done. But there'll be some of you thinking, actually, I'm just happy to sit along, listen to what Phil's got to say, and I might pick it up in the future at some point. Um, that's fine, but it's extremely unlikely that you will actually get it done. So over the coming sessions, uh, the whole object of the exercise is that we've got like a winning post where we can actually say, hey, look what I've done. Um, and once you've done it, it will give you the confidence to do even more. Um, those that you're taking on the book challenge, and we will not get a book written in 21 days. The idea is to actually get it started, but with a roadmap to get it finished as well. And I'm more than happy to help you to do that. Once you've got some of these things done, what you were maybe 
just thinking about doing in your business, but hadn't really got the motivation or confidence to do it, you're then much more likely to do more things as well. So maybe once you've created your first book, you'll want to do another. If you've created a digital product, a download, you'll want to do another. So um, this is about confidence building as much as anything else. Um, I'll be sending you this, uh, the information on when your individual challenges are. I know some of you are doing all of them, which is uh, absolutely fantastic, um, but I'll send you the dates and I'm gonna be opening the private Facebook group today, uh, where again, I'll, I'll make sure that we've, we've got all these in there, but please note the times. If you do miss one, it's not the end of the world because they are all being recorded as well. So when I wrote this book, it was very much a trip down memory lane for me, going back to 1978 when I first started meeting financial advisors. Um, a young broker consultant, I'd done my training, and they said, off you go, Phil, go and see 20 financial advisors every single week and do that forever. And the more financial advisors you go and meet, the more business you will bring into this particular company. Um, and that was really quite interesting. It was very much a numbers game. Literally, the more financial advisors I went to see, the more business came in. Even though we didn't call you IFAs back then, most financial advisors were just known as brokers back then, and most did a bit of pensions, bit of life assurance, bit of protection, bit of mortgage broking, um, Uncle Tom Cobbley and all. But over that time, particularly the first 12 years, I really got to see the good, the bad, and the ugly of financial advisor marketing. Um, and what this book is about is, is really about the best bits of, of what financial advisors are doing. Um, so I'm really proud of that particular book. It's over 400 pages long now. Um, and uh, so one of you will get a free copy of that today. This is the latest one that I've written, and this is not intended to be an advert, but it's supposed to be what happens next. That previous book was about what we've been doing. And this one literally only came out a few weeks ago is about what happens next. And I'm gonna cover off some background as to what I think is, is coming next and why we need to think about it and how our challenges fit into this as well. So I wanna start with, with really what marketing is not. And as I said, this is an introductory session today before we really get stuck into the, the individual challenges, but I'm gonna to touch uh, on all of them. Marketing is not this. There are people, there are marketing people in our industry who will have you believe that this is what we need to be doing. We call it content marketing for want of a better expression. And we really need to have our own podcast. We need to have our own membership scheme. We need to have our own Facebook group, online courses, running webinars, all of this, all of the time. And it's easy to understand why we might be encouraged or think actually we ought to be doing this because all these shiny tools are out there for us to use. But um, the simple fact of the matter is we, it is not sustainable to be doing all of this, if not most of this, all of the time. It just can't be done. Whereas what we really should be thinking about is, okay, let's start with our clients. Let's start with our business. Who is our ideal dream client? If our dream client was to get in touch with us out of the blue today, what would that person or that couple or that business actually look like? And I think it's a really important piece of work to do. And for those of you doing the marketing plan challenge, this is gonna be really central to it. And marketing speak, it's called your client avatar. But ideally, it is literally getting a clean sheet of paper and writing down, who is my perfect dream client? And when we know what that person or people look like, we if we if they are our dream client, let's say for sake of argument, our dream client is, I don't know, heart surgeons in West London who are looking to increase their income in retirement. I mean, that's quite niche, but it's a perfectly valid, um, perfect dream client. If we profess to understand the needs of heart surgeons who are concerned about their income in retirement, it presupposes that we know something about the personal finance situation of heart surgeons. And if we know in depth about the personal finance situation of heart surgeons, then there's a good likelihood that we will know where they hang out. What LinkedIn groups are they in? What podcasts do they listen to? What newspapers do they read? What YouTube channels do they watch? Everybody in niches 
gathers together in certain communities in certain places. And if we discover that they listen to uh, a certain podcast, uh, podcast, or they like a certain YouTube channel, or they like to read certain newsletters, then really out of all these things on this screen, that's what we focus on. And we can quite comfortably cross out the other stuff and think, right, I'm not going to bother with that. One of the problems with social media is there is this sort of pressure on us that we, we need to be using it everywhere all of the time. And if we don't, we're going to miss out. Uh, and that simply isn't the case that we will miss out. It's about getting some real, real focus. Yes, there are some of the things in there that we should be focusing on if we know that's where our dream clients are likely to hang out. But certainly let's get away from this idea that we've got to be doing all of this stuff all of the time because it's not sustainable and it just doesn't work. Um, and one thing I would say is that this pushing to do content marketing, I had a sort of a bit of an epiphany, middle of 2019, where I was guilty of doing this. I'm trying to put stuff out, be everywhere all of the time. And I suddenly realized by just adding to the general noise of the internet, I'm not really adding to adding value to anyone in particular. I'm not doing my business any favors either. And I suddenly decided, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of giving away my content free, I'm going to start charging people for it. And I'm going to do that through webinars. I'm going to do that through books. I'm going to do that through courses. Um, and that just transformed my business. Yes, I still give away some content for free, but only in certain specific areas. But I suddenly realized the expertise, if I profess to have any expertise, I value that expertise. And I hope that other people would value it. So I'm going to put a price on it. Um, and that's made a big difference to me. So for those of you who are doing the book challenge or for those of you doing the digital product challenge, that's going to be a key message uh, within there. So what actually does work for financial advisors? Um, I've done some research um, and I, I've also looked at Michael Kitts's. Those of you that know Michael Kitts is over in the States. He's an amazing guy. Uh, he runs the world's most popular blog for financial planners. Uh, called Nerd's Eye View, if you've not come across it. Again, very American, but lots of it very relevant to the UK as well. And Michael and I kind of come up with these two lists. So the top marketing strategies for experienced and top performing advisors tend to be referrals, not surprisingly, although that is changing, writing books, seminars, webinars, and client events, web listings, joint ventures, LinkedIn, search engine optimization, uh, very modern websites called funnels with lead magnets and the very expensive approach of hiring agencies and consultants. Strategies for brand new advisors or those who might be struggling a little bit. Uh, referrals are still very, very strong, although we really don't do referrals very well. Um, most financial advisors, when it comes to referrals, when I, when I press them, they don't actually have a documented referral strategy which is very different from saying, yeah, you know, we've got a few, we, you know, we do a good job with our clients. So, you know, we're bound to pick referrals. Two very, very different things. A documented referral strategy makes you proactive in your approach to referrals. Just waiting them for them to come in through the door is actually very reactive. Um, and if you want a great resource, I always recommend this resource, a book called Get More Referrals Now by a guy called Bill Cates, C-A-T-E-S, Get More Referrals Now, will teach you how to build a proactive referral strategy. Um, other things, introducers, local advertising still works a treat. You know, although we live in the internet age now, which gives us the perception that we could do business all over the world, uh, which would be great if that's what you want to do, but most financial advisors are quite happy for business to be on their, on their own doorstep. Local advertising, web listings, you know, unbiased, things like that. Seminars, um, if you press me and say, Phil, if you had to do one marketing strategy and one only out of all of these, what would you do? I would always say seminars. Seminars have always been the single most effective marketing strategy for financial advisors. Most of the most successful financial advisors around the world use seminars or live events as part of their uh, proposition. They just work. And for those of you thinking, oh, yeah, I get what you're saying, Phil, but what if nobody turns up? Uh, I'm not wild about public speaking. There's just a process. Follow the process and people turn up and they are wildly 
successful, not just to attract new clients, but also to add value to existing clients and also to add value to uh, professional connections as well. Clearly, we can't do many seminars right now, although there's a roadmap for us to maybe do that. Um, but for those of you that have been doing webinars or are thinking about doing the webinar challenge, webinars are just as good, arguably more so. Uh, good old fashioned networking, uh, BNI, NRG, all those three letter acronym uh, organizations. LinkedIn is amazingly effective. You can see that's on both lists. That's why I've included LinkedIn as one of the challenges. We'll touch a little bit on that in a minute. Creating content that you sell and books as well. We're starting to see more and more financial advisors starting to write books and good old fashioned old school marketing. Uh, one of my favorite ones, it's in, it's in my uh, first book, is a guy called Keith Churchhouse, Chapters Financial Planning in Guildford. His primary marketing strategy was sponsoring a roundabout just outside Guildford. We've all seen it, a roundabout, oh, he can't a roundabout, it's sponsored by, he said that's the single most effective marketing tool he's ever used. He also used to do a bit of radio stuff as well, where he'd appear as like an expert, personal finance expert. And he said the combination of being on the radio and then people seeing the name of his business on a roundabout and he said the roundabout he chose was just perfect it was you know every single day people driving into Guildford thousands and thousands of people would see it and then they'd see it again on the way home as well so that combination of old school and and maybe using digital as well is is remarkably effective however we've got a bit of bit of a problem um, traditional marketing is starting to run out of steam. I mean, these things tend to come and go. Over the years, over my 42 years working with advisors, things come and go. Uh, things disappear, then they come back, but they come back differently. Right now, we can't go to networking events. Right now, we can't do seminars. Right now, we can't go to trade shows. Web listings, I mean, we've all seen the comments in the Facebook group about the traditional web suppliers web listing suppliers, the quality just isn't as good as it used to be. Social media, uh, you know, unless you've got a full on plan and you're prepared to pay, this idea that social media is free marketing, uh, we've got to start moving that one to, to one side as well. And this idea that referrals will just keep coming in automatically is something else we need to address as well. In the, the, in the old days, if at a dinner party, someone you said, can, does anybody know a financial advisor? Um, and somebody said, yeah, check out my financial advisor, Jason Mountjoy, he's great. Uh, we would write Jason's name down on the napkin and the next day we'd phone him up. But these days we've got the internet. So if somebody says, check out Jason, before we phone him up, we're gonna go check him out online. We're gonna check him out on Google, see if he actually exists. We wanna see a photo of him. Does he look professional? What's his website look like? What's his LinkedIn profile like? And it may well be while we're checking out Jason on uh, Google or LinkedIn, we may well get distracted and we might spot Neil, we might spot James, or we might think, oh, maybe, maybe Jason, sorry, Jason, maybe Jason's not the right person. Maybe we wanna go talk to James instead. So this idea that referrals will just keep coming in automatically is start to creak a little. And that's why I stress the need to have a, um, a documented proactive strategy for referrals that moves on. And it's worth having a look at a bit of history here as well about how uh, marketing changed, particularly when digital first started to appear. Um, 98, 2010, that was when it all started to happen. Uh, we were starting to learn about it. I remember standing in front of financial advisors in about 2000, was it 2007, a, a PFS event, I think it was, and said, you want to watch out for this thing called Twitter, because it will become part of our lives in some way, shape or form. And everyone in the, in the audience crossed their arms and said, no, it won't. Yet top lit, Twitter is now just a core communication tool. Love it or hate it, it's there, people use it. So between that period, we were just starting to get the hang of digital it wasn't called social media back then, it was called social networking. LinkedIn, when LinkedIn appeared in 2003, the whole point of LinkedIn was to complement the real world networking that you actually did in bars, in hotels, at BNI meetings. And those of you doing the LinkedIn challenge will discover that the LinkedIn algorithm is still designed to reward LinkedIn members who treat the site as a networking platform and not a broadcasting platform. Um, social media is just noise. 
irritating, fun, it's got its problems, no question about that. It's just noise. Although, and although people are getting better at filtering the noise, it's noise. And we're just adding to it as well. But if you think of it in terms of social networking, and networking is all about human beings interacting, engaging, supporting one another, just like you do in the Facebook group, then you see differences. We tended to see digital as an exciting new opportunity, largely because it was free. Uh, we don't have to pay for this stuff. We can just bang some stuff out there. Uh, will get attention and it might lead to some clients. Then came the golden era where things started to settle down. Um, and if you were using social media or social networking platform back then, it was dead easy to get followers, just follow other people. And I'm, I remember um, teaching people at the time. Uh, people would say, how do you get followers? And I say, follow other people. They'll follow you back, human nature. Um, it was really easy to get followers. Um, really easy to get engagement on your posts. Pretty well everyone would see anything that you put out there. Um, it was just free business. If you did it even on a reasonably consistent basis, you were considered an influencer. Um, and it was an amazing return on wasting time. Um, and we've, we've all done that. Uh, we may all still do that as well. Um, there's a lot of time wasting goes on on social media. But back then, it actually worked. However, things are changing. Um, everyone's on social media out now. The noise levels are ridiculous. It is actually quite difficult to get attention unless you are quite sophisticated about how you use filters and hashtags and things like that. The platforms are now monetizing. That means if you want a really good return from social media, you need to pay. Now, intrinsically, I've got a problem with paying to use Facebook or paying to use LinkedIn providing you pay in a strategic way and that for every, say, one pound in advertising that I pay for, I must get two pounds or more comes out the other side. Um, that's the only way. That's the only sustainable way. Unfortunately, there are very, very few Facebook advertising experts in the financial advisor community. I know two one who is amazing, who generates pension, quality pension and investment leads, but you've got to have a budget to do it. But, you know, if you spend £100 on Facebook ads and you get £500 comes out, your budget can just go as high as you like and you can just switch it on or off as, as you see fit. So social media today, you get a very poor return on wasting time. Um, and if you are going to use social media, you really do need to have some focus. You really need to have a strategy as well. What about 2021? Um, it's time to start taking marketing, planning and strategy really quite seriously. Um, with apologies to uh, those of you in the group who have already nailed this. The vast majority of financial advisors do not have a documented marketing plan for their financial advice business. And this is largely because referrals have been the source of business. So, you know, why do we need to think about this kind of stuff? We also need to think very, very seriously about conversions. And by conversions, I mean turning people who visit your website into conversations that might lead to a client. The overwhelming majority of financial advisors do not know how many people are visiting their website. The research I've done shows the overwhelming majority of financial advisors don't know where to find the numbers even. The guy or the girl who did our website, maybe they've got it. Oh, I think we've got Google Analytics, but I wouldn't know where to find them. We've got us, this is key management information that we've really got to get on top of. Or allocate someone in your business to be on top of this kind of information. So most financial advisors today have got quite nice looking websites. Um, and I say quite nice looking website. They are, well, they're in some really good firms creating some fantastic looking online brochures. And you have to ask the question, why would someone want to read your brochure on a screen any more than read it on a piece of shiny, glossy paper? The whole point of having a website for most financial planners is to convert visitors into conversations or to have a website whose sole purpose is to add value to existing clients. 
perhaps through portals, perhaps through the videos that you've created. This is the place for your free content, for your existing clients, for your professional connections. But what most financial advisors' websites tend to do is be a bit of everything for everybody. And they are really letting themselves down. And what most financial advisors are quite surprised to discover is that you've got all the leads you will ever want right under your nose. They are people who are visiting your website today, but your website is not reaching out to them. It's not engaging with them. It's not taking them by the hand and saying, come into my world. And if you are a financial advisor that, say, specializes in retirement planning for heart surgeons, and I've done my search on Google, and I come across your website, and your website says to me, are you a heart surgeon concerned about your income in retirement? Enter your email address here and download our free guide on how to increase your income in retirement. There is no way that me, as a heart surgeon, concerned about my income retirement, there is no way I will not download your free guide because your website is speaking to me. What most financial advisors' websites tend to do is they tend to try and speak to several different people all at one go. Uh, so that's what I mean by conversions. Uh, personalized marketing is becoming much more important as well. I haven't really got time to go into that right now. Starting to build relationships with experts and influencers within the wider industry as well. Educational assets, and that is a key thing we are talking about now. By educational assets, I mean ebooks, free downloads, online courses, a book. Those are educational assets. They are really, really powerful because they set you apart from everybody else. Now, whilst most financial advisors are not in competition with each other, if a prospect can see that you've written something, and even if that something is only two pages long or it's 200 pages long, that says something about you. It's the best business card you'll ever have. And curiosity is something as well, as well that's becoming really, really important. We really got to, when, when people visit our websites or they come into your world, we want them to be really curious about, I want to know more, more about Lee. I want to know more about Harry. Uh, because from what I'm seeing here, they're the sort of people I want to investigate further. So these are the five challenges. Challenge number one, increase your LinkedIn profile views by 100%. And that is doable within three weeks. Um, I've had it happen in 10 days before now, but we've said 21 days. Um, and there'll be a way to measure this as well. Um, when I work one-to-one -one with financial advisors, 100% increase over the course of a month, if you follow the stuff, is really quite doable. Now, why is it important uh, to do that. First of all, LinkedIn is proven to be effective in generating the right leads that you want. And I stress the right leads. Uh, it always amuses me when I see in our Facebook group, whenever anyone mentions LinkedIn, uh, the same comments come up. Uh, we get a few people say, oh, I used to be on LinkedIn, but all the recruiters were banging on my door. Um, so I'm not interested and it's never been of any use. Um, and the simple fact of the matter is, if you as a financial advisor are having recruiters contacting you on LinkedIn, what that means is that you set up your profile to appeal to recruiters. Un un unwittingly, you've done that. Whereas you've not set it up to appeal to heart surgeons or whoever your target market is. Um, LinkedIn today is how Facebook was five years ago. As we said just a few minutes ago, five years ago, you could put anything on Facebook, you'd get attention and you'd pick up clients. The only thing is five years ago, most financial advisors kept well clear of Facebook in any kind of business sense because of fear of tripping over some appalling compliance gaffe, something like that. So financial advisors for the most part have missed out on the, the golden era of free Facebook. There's still paid Facebook, which you can use today, which is, and it's still remarkably powerful. But LinkedIn today is how Facebook was five years ago. Massive free organic reach. You don't even need to have premium membership of LinkedIn either. Um, but what we'll be covering off most of, the most of it is techniques 
to drive people to your profile on LinkedIn. That's one of the things we're really going to be focusing on. You will probably, if you've been on LinkedIn any period of time, you'll have had some consultant at some point get in touch with you and say, give us a grand a month and we'll do reach out for you uh, and to find clients and leads and we'll put them on some sort of database for you. Uh, you will have probably had that. When in fact, that's not how the LinkedIn algorithm works. There are ways to position yourself on LinkedIn so that the algorithm finds you, puts you higher in the search engine. And you've got to remember that LinkedIn is a search engine as well these days. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to create content. Uh, and I don't mean content as in content marketing, but other types of content that will send people to your profile so that people will see what you're doing on LinkedIn. They will get curious. Remember, I talked about curiosity and they'll go, who is this guy called Lee Gardner? I want to check him out. We better go look at his profile. And then I'm going to show you how to, in the right ways and the wrong ways, to engage with them so that you can then start a conversation. I mean, I think all of you will probably agree that at some point when a new lead appears on your desk, whether it's come from unbiased, vouch for, a seminar that you've done, someone's found, made contact through your website, at some point, you've got to have a conversation with them, haven't you? Whether it's on the phone, in a coffee shop, on Zoom, at some point, you've got to get a bit of information so that you can, at the very least, decide, nah, you're not for me. Um, so it's about using LinkedIn in a way that enables you to have a conversation. And the more opportunities for conversations that you can have, the more likely you're going to, you know, you're going to uh, have the right conversations. And you can, you'll be, actually be able to get to a point where you can actually be dismissing in, more inquiries than you actually take on because they're not the right people. That's not to say you won't want to put them onto your, say, your email newsletter list because they may refer you in due course or your webinar list, whatever it is. So we will, over the next 21 days, show you how to nail LinkedIn uh, as a tool. And you will wish you had been using LinkedIn years ago. Challenge number two, plan your first client communication webinar. Um, I'm increasingly putting the words client communication in there because there is a perception amongst, uh, we've all got a perception of what a webinar is, haven't we? Particularly if you've ever been on a webinar that's been put on by some guru uh, in the United States, you get like an hour of, of, of content and then you get an hour of sales pitch. Um, and that's that's just one webinar model. And you either like that model or you don't like that model, uh, but that is not the model that I'm going to be teaching uh, for financial advisors. To me, as I've already said, seminars are the single most effective marketing tool for financial advisors for a whole bunch of different reasons. But webinars are just as good, arguably, if not better, but they are an absolutely brilliant way to communicate with clients on a regular basis. And I just want to give one simple example of, of a financial advisor I know who is using this, who ha is still doing like a monthly email newsletter. But what he's doing, uh, he's just south of Manchester. Um, what he's doing is every Monday morning, he will do a webinar to his existing clients and to his professional connections, where he reviews the personal finance sections of the weekend papers that have just gone. So for example, and, and this is a really important thing because almost every single financial advisor's clients are being educated on personal finance by journalists, um, whether we like it or not they are being educated by journalists and increasingly influences on TikTok and all that nonsense as well. But the simple fact of the matter is, if you have the sort of clients that I believe you have, the chances are they read a reasonably quality newspaper. They, probably, they might read the Saturday Telegraph, which has got a really good personal finance section. They might read the Sunday Times, which has got a really good personal finance section, they might read the mail on Sunday, wherever, they are all reading articles about personal finance, where really the sort of people who should be educating consumers about personal finance is actually financial advisors, not journalists. So what this guy does uh, south of Manchester is every Monday morning, he picks three 
personal finance articles from the weekend press and he reviews it on his live webinar just like we're doing right now and he says hi everybody great to see you again uh, the first article I've got is from the uh, Saturday Telegraph where there was an article about equity release the journal that's made this point made this point it was quite a good article but he missed this glaring point here um, and really you should be looking at article about equity release in this context you see what I'm saying they need to pick an article about something maybe there was an article in the Sunday Times about inheritance tax or corporation tax or something like that said really interesting article but he missed this point here um, and you know, that's kind of how he does it and it doesn't take him much longer than 20 minutes easy peasy really really simple it's about keeping the relationship plates spinning with the clients giving them some value um, and on some days there's like three to five people on his webinar sometimes there's 30 or 40 on his webinar he doesn't really mind but he can record every single one of them if he wants to he could stick them on his youtube channel he could do whatever he likes with it it's as simple as that that's one example of a client communication webinar. You can also use them as client attraction, just as you can use seminars in a local hotel, you can also use webinars as well. So what we're gonna do on this particular um, uh, challenge is we're gonna show you some examples, talk about best practice, uh, how long they should be, what you should cover, what you shouldn't cover, what people actually want to hear you talking about, how to promote them, uh, the presentation, um, the tools, the tech that you need to do, super easy. I mean, the, the number one benefit of webinars is, you know, you don't have to pay for a hotel room. You don't have to buy lunch. You, it's, it's, and it's free to do, for goodness sake, which is absolutely amazing. So that's one of the reasons that we're including webinars. And the end of the challenge, you will be ready to roll. You will have a date in the diary uh, to put your first uh, webinar together and you'll have done pretty well all the work so that all you're gonna do is turn up on the day. Number three, create a marketing plan for your financial advice business. Uh, this kind of goes to the goes to the heart of it. You know, pick your quotation. We all, we all know this one. If we don't plan stuff, then stuff doesn't happen. And if it does happen, it's more by luck than any, any good judgment as well. Uh, I put this one in because most financial advisors, you know, well, you've kind of got a marketing plan. It may be part of the business plan but just to have something written down that's pinned up on the wall or something you can share with all your colleagues it just crystallizes what we're about um, and this isn't going to be something that's, that's like a 50 page uh, document this will be something that you can pin up you'll be proud of you can refer to you can tick things off measure yourself against uh, as each month or each quarter or as each year goes by um, but a really powerful one that is and so so important Number four, create your first digital product to sell or give away. Wow. What's a digital product and why a digital product? Well, anything. Again, let's use the heart surgeon example. I'm a heart surgeon. I've arrived on your website and it says, are you a heart surgeon? Concerned about your income in retirement? Download our free guide for heart surgeons. There's no way I'm not going to give you my email address. It's a fair exchange of value. You, the financial advisor, get an email address. Me, the heart surgeon, I get something which I can make an immediate determination about you, the financial advisor. Do you sound like you know what you're talking about? But even before that, even before I've started reading it, the fact that you've got an e-guide or a download um, that relates to my problems, my concerns, just positions you head and shoulders above the other financial advisors in the area. So enhances the perception of your expertise. It can be anything you like, a digital product. Uh, it could be a, a, a three video YouTube course. It could be a, a two page PDF uh, for how heart surgeons can increase their income. Um, it could be a podcast. To be quite honest, it, it's a whole bunch of different things which we're going to go into. And those of you doing that particular challenge, you better choose which, which particular thing you want to do. Um, quite apart from anything else, it can actually create a new income stream for you. Um, most people, you will not make millions by any stretch of the imagination, but you will be quite surprised to see a steady uh, trickle coming in of new income coming in and when you once you've done one you've created your first little e-guide or your first little e-book or something like that you'll want to do another and then you want to do another 
and then you'll want to do another as well. Um, it could even be a, a Kindle ebook as well. You could create, uh, you know, there's people making a huge income um, on Amazon, uploading 10 page, a 10 page Word document to Kindle. Um, no, I, I show off a bit and say, well, I've written 20 books. Well, I was talking to a lady the other day in the States who is what you call a professional author. And by a professional author, I don't mean someone like Lee Child uh, or JK Rowling. What I mean is someone who monitors trends on the internet about topics of interest. And they use fancy software to do this. They, they monitor topics of interest. So for example, right now, a topic of interest would be working from home, health and well-being while you're working at home. Yep. And what they do is they monitor trends, uh, topics of interest, and then they hire ghost writers to write a book or a guide uh, anything from 10 pages to as long as, as as big as you want. So someone else writes it. Um, and then they publish it under their name uh, as a Kindle. And it never goes to paperback or anything like that. I said to this lady, uh, so how many of these books have you have you done? And she said, last count, 24,000. He's written 24,000 books. I say written, she's published 24,000 books that other people have written. And you can only imagine the income stream that comes in. And she's only going to publish books that people are actually interested in right now. So you could create a simple PDF that just sits on your website, or we could even take it a stage further and upload it to Amazon as well. Uh, a digital product also sits very nicely on your value ladder. And I do want to talk about value ladders in just a second, because you can see how this all fits together. A digital product is also highly targeted. I use the heart surgeons example there as well. Um, really, really important. Um, and it's super easy to do, sell, manage and deliver. I just want to see if there's a couple of questions there. Um, uh, Adam, I'll drop you a line. In fact, when you when I open up the Facebook group, uh, a, um, a, Adrian's asked, who was the Facebook expert you mentioned? Um, I'll put her name in the Facebook group and her contact details so you can get in touch and talk to her yeah uh, what are my thoughts on clubhouse uh it's a bit noisy it's already started being banned uh, so those of you not familiar with clubhouse clubhouse is like um online forums but just audio um it is a way to another way to position yourself as an expert so it's like uh you can uh, they call them rooms you create a room and you just broadcast, there's no video, it's just you talking, people engage with you. It's, a, you know, it's another shiny new thing. Um, so we remain, it remains to be seen. It's only available on uh, to Apple users at the moment. They will open it up to Android at some point. There's already been a data leak. Um, so it remains to be seen, but like all of these things, they, they go through their, um, you know, teething problems to, to start with. Okay, back over here. Number five, start writing your first book. Now, this will be seen as the big one for a lot of people. Um, and the thought of writing a book, my goodness me, but I hope what I've already managed just to get across is what's a book these days? A, it, a book doesn't have to be the length of Harry Potter. A book can be just 10 pages, a lot, 10 pages long. My book on how to make the perfect gin and tonic at home, I think is 15, 20 pages, something like that. My marketing book, yeah, 400 pages. But we need to move away from the idea that a book needs to be a massive, great tome. Uh, if that's what you want to do, absolutely fantastic. Not got a problem with that. So we'll be looking at the different types of book you can be writing, um, how to get started, a plan to follow. We'll be looking in depth as to the benefits um, to financial advisors. Writing, writing a book you know, will be the single best business card that you will ever give away to anybody. Um, and like anything else, it's like putting on a seminar. If you just follow the process, you will get there in the end. Um, that I say get there in the end, it, you know, um, that might take a couple of years, but it's also, I know people who've written a book in two hours as well. Any of you know Grant Cardone, he's the kind of real estate guy in the United States, He's like sort of Tony Robbins for real estate, very loud, very brash, very rich, very noisy, very irritating. But he wrote a global best-selling book in, in an afternoon. 
Um, and, and most of it, he just recorded, he just brain dumped his record, his thoughts uh, onto an audio file and then transcribed the audio file, um, did a little bit of editing, job done, global bestseller. Uh, and he says, he always amuses him when he gets people getting in touch and said, Grant, there's so many typos in this book. The grammar's terrible. He says, do you think I care? <laughs> I'm making millions from this thing as well. So uh, we'll be looking at what actually is a book, what are the different ways of doing it, and we'll give you a process. And after 21 days, you will have uh, you will have started, let's put it that way, and we'll show you how to get started. And I will make sure that you get it finished as well. Um, let's just talk about this value ladder concept because it's super important to understand. Uh, what is a value ladder? That, well, the purpose of a value ladder is to make it easier to start conversations and build relationships with prospects and clients. The vast majority of financial advisors do not have a value ladder. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So let's use an extreme example of a value ladder. And let's use Tony Robbins. Love him or hate him. Um, if you've never discovered Tony Robbins before, the, probably the first place you'll discover him is on YouTube uh, through a video. And you'll get you'll see one of the, any of this sort of thing here, stop your negative thinking, yeah? 30 minutes for the next 30 years of your life. Attitude is everything, yeah? All that good Tony Robbins stuff, love it or hate it, but millions of people absolutely love it. And if you watch one of these videos and you like it, you'll watch another, then you'll watch another. And before you're now, you know it, two hours has gone down, gone by, and you've gone down a rabbit hole that you'll find difficult to go get out of. And the YouTube algorithm will make sure that every time you go onto YouTube, you'll be shown another Tony Robbins um, video. And if you've liked Tony Robbins on YouTube, you will inevitably want to go and see, is he on Facebook? And sure enough, he's on Facebook and uh, maybe he's doing a Facebook Live. So you go, cool, that's free. So I'll register for Tony Robbins Facebook Live, sign up for that. You think, yeah, this is absolutely great. Uh, what else does Tony do? And then we go to his website and we discover that he's got a new book out. And yes, guys, Tony is now stepping into the financial planning world. What's more, he's giving this book away for free. All you gotta do is pay for the shipping and he wants you to pay for the shipping not because he's tight or anything like that, but if you get your credit card out, that shows a micro commitment. Uh, it shows that you're prepared to at least pay for something and it makes it much more likely that you'll pay for something else in the future. And your book arrives and you enjoy the book and then the link, the Facebook algorithm makes sure that you see the next time Tony's in town. And sure enough, Tony's in town, one day event, I've loved his videos, I've loved his book, I loved his Facebook Live, I think I'm gonna get my credit card out and we'll go along to the one day event and you have a great old time. You're at the back, you can barely see him, but Tony's over there, but you still have a great old time and you uh, take a few photos and you put them on Instagram and you tell all your mates, I've just been to the Tony Robbins event, it was awesome. And okay, and then you get a few more emails from Tony. And a few months down the line, Tony's in town again, a much, much bigger event. You think, wow, I better go to this. Now this is a bit more money, but I've enjoyed it all so far, uh, let's pay some more. We go along, we have a great old time. Um, we tell all our friends. A few months down the line, Facebook makes sure that we see the next big event. And we're thinking, you know, Tony's part of my life now. He's really made me much more positive. I'm getting stuff done. I'm doing well in my work. My love life's better, whatever. Um, I'm gonna fork out a bit more money. I'm gonna go to the seats at the front. I'm gonna do the meet and greet with Tony. Maybe I'm going to do the fire walking. I'm going to get a selfie with Tony while I'm there. And I'm going to put it on Instagram. But this is going to cost me a bit more money. But I'm more than happy to get my credit card out because of the value I've got from Tony as we go by. And we go along. We have a great old time. And we think that's it. But it isn't until this baby turns up in our inbox. Now, this is a five-figure investment. Okay, now not everyone will be able to afford to go this, but a lot of people who first discovered Tony on YouTube will go to this because the value has been there and it's gone up in steps. The value has got better and better and better. And so we go along to this so that we can spend time with Tony at a lovely resort and other people like ourselves. And we go along, we think, wow, that was it. That was the pinnacle until this turns up in our inbox. This is a six figure investment. And again, not everyone's gonna go this far, but some people do where they can go and spend 
a long weekend with Tony at his home in Fiji with other people just like himself, uh, just like you. Um, and that, I mean, that is a, a value ladder. That's an extreme value ladder, but that's how value ladders work. Now, let's bring it a little bit closer to home. Let's use someone more akin to you guys. What about the value ladder for a dentist? Uh, typically, this is what you will see from a local dentist these days. To get you, just get you in the building, they'll offer free teeth cleaning or maybe free teeth whitening. I mean, there was a time when only people like Tony Robbins could afford teeth whitening. Okay, but now it's very common. So a lot of dentists, they'll do it for free, just get you in the building, treat you really well. Uh, they'll get video testimonials off you right at that early stage really treat you well so that it makes it much more likely that you're going to go up the value ladder because what they really want is they want an ongoing subscription for you from you that's where the real money is yeah what they really want is for you to do the high-end cosmetic work as well which is open to anybody these days it's still expensive but it's open now my dad was a high-end cosmetic dental surgeon uh, he had a lot of a-list um, actors and a lot of uh, world-class professional golfers as well and they all wanted white teeth and they all wanted cosmetic dentistry that's where the real money was for you guys in the financial planning world the real money is at the high end it's not at the low end but we don't have any intermediate steps as financial advisors um, what about the value ladder for a chiropractor again get you in the building what they really want you to do is to pay an ongoing plan. And ideally, they want you to pay a lot of money to go on their long weekend wellness retreat at some nice hotel, uh, do a bit of yoga, meditate, all that good stuff. Yeah, that's what they really want you to pay for. But to encourage you and to build a relationship with you, they want to get you in, give you the free stuff, treat you really well, so that it becomes much more likely that there's an ongoing longer term relationship. What about the value ladder for a gym? Well, I mean, the value ladder for a gym actually has a, a start date. It's usually January the 1st, isn't it? Get you in for free, treat you nice. What they really want you to do is do the on ongoing coaching, spend the real money. So uh, my value ladder for financial advisors looks a bit like this. Down at the bottom, in fact, in an ideal world, what I really want is for financial advisors to do 12 month coaching with me and to come on my long weekend deep dive marketing retreat. But if that was all I ever put on my website, financial advisors arrive on my website, will go, well, who is this Phil Calvert guy? Why am I going to fork out all this money when I have no idea what he does or anything about him? So I start at the bottom. Um, the conversations I have with financial advisors on Facebook are all designed to send people to my Facebook group or my marketing group or to my scorecard, which we'll talk about another time. The stuff in green is free. The value in that Facebook group for um, financial advisors, and we've got Harry uh, on the call as well, uh, fairly new to the to the to the industry here. Yeah? The value for financial advisors of all ages in that Facebook group is off the scale, um, and yet it's free. Uh, many times people have said to me, "Why why don't you charge for this group, Phil? Why don't you do an ongoing subscription?" Um, but I take the view that it's a fantastic lead magnet for want of a better better thing. Yeah. I give away free ebooks, free e guides, and there's the scorecard. Most of you have done the marketing mindset. That is a scorecard. You hopefully got some value by getting a score and a report. I got not just your email address, but I got the answers to every one of your questions. I could, in theory, now follow up each and every one of you. I could go, hey, hey, Lee, uh, great to see you took the scorecard. Hope you found it interesting. Um, you scored really quite well in that particular category, but there's a few gaps in this category. Is that something you'd like to work on? Um, and it's no wonder that scorecards are becoming, start, really start to get the attention of financial advisors because it's like people pre-filling a fact find before you even talk to them so that you can get a sense of which clients you actually want to work with. Then there's webinars. So the things in blue are either free or they're chargeable. The books, I either give them away for free or you buy them. 
The things in black are always chargeable, live workshops, coaching calls, until we go up and up and up. The stuff in red is uh, properly expensive. But that's a value ladder. People aren't gonna buy the expensive stuff until they've experienced the free stuff and the, and the low price stuff. That's how a value ladder works. And so this is what a financial advisor's value ladder might look like. There's no way it's gonna be all of this, but it could be three or four of the things on this list. So at the very bottom, those of you doing the digital product, uh, it could be an e-guide, a tips book, an audio book, a podcast or something like that, yeah? Low price or free stuff, but high value going further up. So there's no earthly reason why financial advisors can't do their own weekend or overseas retreats or inner circles as you, as you, might, as you might call them. What's really interesting is that for most financial pl planners, financial planning is the only thing on your value ladder the only thing. And we're expecting people to arrive on our website and go, yeah, you're the financial planner for me. Um, I'll go with that without anything to encourage people into your world first. So this is one of the reasons why we're doing the digital uh, product uh, challenge as well. And also LinkedIn, because I think LinkedIn is actually very much part of your value ladder. When someone arrives on your LinkedIn profile, and maybe you have a conversation with them. That's an early step on your value ladder as well. Um, just to make the point about the weekend or overseas retreat, I know financial planners over in the United States who now don't do financial planning anymore. All they do is financial planning retreats where you pay a lot of money and you go to a really nice hotel where they get in guest speakers, some celebrity chefs, but the whole thing is based around personal finance, lifestyle planning, and all that good stuff as well. And I know one particular guy, he does a, a, a he calls it a weekend wealth symposium, and he charges $20,000 a head for the weekend. I mean, who'd want to do financial planning if people are paying you $20,000? And he's got a queue for months and months. So that's what I mean by value letter. Uh, Martin Bamford, He's written three books very much still when he has new clients coming in he they often comment to him oh i got your book a few months ago or a few years ago whatever it's an obvious step on the value ladder it says something about him there is a clear implication of expertise yeah catherine morgan those of you that know catherine rising star in the financial planning world in the financial coaching world uh, she uses facebook extensively and she does challenges a bit like what we're doing a five-day challenge to help you identify what kind of relationship you have with money, unlock self-beliefs that are holding you back, give you confidence, pay yourself first, plug those leaks forever. This is really simple stuff to do. All you got to do is plan it. Um, and so those of you uh, who are doing that, we could help you put a challenge together as well. Uh, Pete Matthew, I think we all know Pete, um, Jackson's financial planning down in uh, Penzance, you know, he's really nailed this, really, really nailed it. And I always use him as an example because I can't think of a better example. There are financial planners who've got some really good books out there, Jason Butler, uh, case in point, uh, of Bloomsbury. But Pete's really nailed this. And this his journey started over 10 years ago now. Um, he started, in fact, I gave him uh, his first camera. Um, he came along to an event I was putting on. We had a little draw and I'd got a digital camera and he won it. And he started re recording little videos down there in Cornwall. And, you know, the quality was a bit hit and miss, but it was the content that was amazing. Um, no personal, there was no financial advice, no financial promotions, just education. And he propped the camera up on a fence in a field in Cornwall. And he go, hi, guys, it's Pete here today. Today we're going to talk about uh, income protection. So what is income protection? And he talked for five minutes about this is what income protection is. This is why it's really important. Full stop. Need to leave it at that. And it's gradually moved into his podcast, which has become legendary. He's now had millions and millions. And I have to say, I was one of the first people to say, who on earth is going to listen to a personal finance podcast? How wrong was I? Uh, millions of people listen to this. And he said, what's really interesting is that the people who approach him after listening to his podcast, tend to be his dream clients. You might be forgiven for thinking that a personal finance podcast would by 
its very nature tend to bring in the wrong type of inquiries. He says, what I don't get, Phil, is I don't get people saying, Pete, I've just listened to your podcast. It was great. Could you just tell me if I'm being ripped off on my credit card charges? He says he doesn't get that sort of thing. You'd expect to get that sort of thing, but he doesn't. He said, people like that go to, who's the other guy who's on the telly? I can't remember his name, but you know who I mean. Um, and he tends to get people who, who said, uh, Pete, I've been listening to your podcast for the last six months. Uh, I found it absolutely fascinating. I've learned a, a hell of a lot. I've joined your Facebook group. I bought your books. I'm doing your course, but I really think I need personal attention. Um, how do we work together? Um, so he's the, the, the example. And, uh, you know, it's been a long road for him. But those of you that want to do the digital product and create a podcast, we can get you going. We can do that as well. So starting to wrap up, uh, I think from my part, um, I hope you really enjoy doing this. But it would be great, and I'm not being condescending in this, if we put some effort in. I want you to, to achieve something. And I want you to be proud of what you get at the end of it. So you can wave it at your colleagues or at your clients and say, look what I did. Um, and it would be great if we, could, if we were really open-minded, try out some new stuff, try out something that you might have thought of. We tried that in the past. It didn't work. Uh, to be curious, to ask lots of questions. Uh, I'll make sure you've got my email address so you can ask questions at any time. Um, if there's something you're worried about, it doesn't work, think about instead of saying, I, I don't think that will work, just to reframe it, think, okay, what's the opportunity that comes, up, comes here? Ask for ideas, get feedback, help each other. Feel free to ask questions of each other. Trust the process. Um, it's a bit like, you know, if I said to you, put on your first seminar, there is a process, follow the process, it works. If I said to you, write a book, follow the process, it works. Uh, and above all, just enjoy this, yeah? Um, just by putting a challenge in front of financial advisors, I thought by, I thought it would just be interesting to see what sort of take up we have on this. Um, but it's been great to see um, so many people doing this. Time management will be really, really important. Um, and a time management technique that I recommend to get stuff done, whether you're writing a book or doing anything else for that matter, is called the Pomodoro Technique, written by Francesco, a real great book about um, how to manage your time and how to get stuff done. Um, and, and particularly if you're doing the, uh, any, if at any of the challenges, you need to actually put time aside to make sure it gets done or it won't get done. Particularly the case in the book writing challenge, you will stare at a blank sheet of paper um, and then you'll think, oh, I'll, I'll start that in a minute. And I'll, in the meantime, I'll go and watch some um, YouTube videos. Broadly speaking, the Pomodoro technique is this 25 minutes of work with no distractions literally turn your phone off turn social media off turn your emails off turn everything off and just focus for 25 minutes then have a five minute break and actually walk away from the screen go take a walk go and do some yoga whatever it is and then repeat that four more times then at the end of that, take a 20 minute break and you can either stop at that point or recycle I mean you've got a day job to do anyway but just dedicate 25 minutes, five minute break, another 25 minutes, five minute break, 25 minutes break. But even if you just do 25 minutes, that will literally start the process. Human beings are hardwired to want to finish things they start. They don't always finish them, but you know, when you start a project and then it kind of pauses, you, it's always at the back of your mind and it's always niggling and it's always irritating that you've not finished it. And that is a mechanism that humans have that once we've started something, we have to finish it. Uh, but breaking your time down into little chunks will really genuinely make all the difference, okay? Uh, but that's a great book, but worth getting on Amazon. Um, I've just sort of <laughs> grossly simplified uh, what he's done, but that's essentially what it is. Great book to get um, if you want to get it from there. So I'm going to uh, open up the group at some point. I can see some of you already applied to join it. Um, we'll have the timings. We'll have a few other bits and pieces. I'm going to put a recording of today's uh, presentation in there as well. And if you've not found the group, I'll send you that link as well. Um, so these are the dates that are coming up. 1st of March uh, next week, LinkedIn challenge. Second, the book writing starts. Third, the webinar planning 
starts on the fourth, the marketing plan and the digital product. So those of you that are doing all of them, pick one that you actually want to go to live, um, but you will get all of the videos for all of them. As I said, some of you are doing absolutely all of them, which is awesome. Um, real gluttons for punishment, but well done. And I take my hat off to you for doing that. Um, so thank you very much for uh, your time today. I hope you found that um, of interest. Hope you found it of value. Have we got any questions right now? Um, because I'm more than happy to take those now. So just unmute yourself or anything like that if you want to ask a question right now. Uh, if not, we're fine and we're good to go. And we can crack on with our day. Um, no questions as far as I can see right now, which is fantastic. So I hope you found that useful. Uh, thank you very much for your time today. Really looking forward to working with you. As I said, anybody got any questions anytime, just drop me a line and I'm more than happily help you out. So thanks a lot and uh, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you.